Thank you for joining us today. Please note that there is no CPE attached to this webinar. Please view our upcoming events and webinars at cbh.com for CPE opportunities. Our presentation will begin in a moment. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on revised limitation on subcontracting. Jerry Becker is a national accounting and consulting firm that specializes in working with government contractors. We periodically provide webinars on topics that are of interest to our government contract clients. Today's webinar will feature a discussion on some proposed changes to subcontracting rules. I'd like to introduce the speakers for today. My name is Susan Moser. I'm a partner and the founder of the firm's Government Contract Services Group. I'll be your host and moderator today. Along with me, I have two of my colleagues joining me. John Ford is a senior consultant. He has been a member of our government contracts practice for many years. Prior to working with Cherry Becker over 10 years ago, John was the former Deputy General Counsel at DCAA. He is also a retired Army Colonel and has had a number of different positions in government procurement. In addition to John, Eric Poppy, is a member of our Government Contract Services Group also. Eric is a senior manager in our group and works with government contractors on a host of compliance uh, and accounting issues. For today's format, we plan to go over this information uh, rather quickly. Sometimes we allow for questions during the presentation. Because this is a proposed rule, we will um, not be taking questions during the webinar. However, if you do have questions that you would like to ask, feel free to send us uh, your question. We will respond directly. If it's a question that we think has broader interest, when we provide uh, the follow-up uh, email with the access to the slides, we'll provide any additional information if we think it would be of value to, to the collective group. So with that, let me just cover today's agenda. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to go over what the current rules are as it relates to subcontracting. When I talk about when we, we talk about this, this is related to small businesses that subcontract to other businesses. So right now, there's no distinction between whether you subcontract to a small business or a large business for the most part, except in limited circumstances. So we're going to go over what the current but the current uh, rules are for different types of contracts. Then um, John is going to talk about um, the proposed rule and the background and um, how this uh, proposed rule will play out. And then we'll talk about uh, some of the timeline for, for implementation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Eric Poppy, who will talk about what the current rules are. Thank you, Susan. Um, as Susan mentioned, we'd like to first talk about what the current 50% rule is regarding subcontract limitations. Uh, this will help set the framework that we'll be able to dive in on what really the difference is for this new proposed rule. So you'll see that all of those FAR 52 clauses um, are for, are these are the contract clauses that would be included in your contract depending on what type of contract award it is. Um, so for hub zone or SD, um, VOSB, uh, these are the contract clauses that would be incorporated and all relate to the 50% rule that the prime contractor has to comply with. Really, what is the 50% rule? Uh, it's very similar across all of those different contract clauses. What really the, the meat and potatoes of it is that the contractor must perform at least 50% of the cost or services of the contract. Um, there is some slight variation depending on what type of award it is. However, I, I think the, the big point that we want to make is this is over the life of the contract. So uh, it's 50% in aggregate. So if you have, uh, when you're pricing a proposal currently, if in the first year you're subcontracting out 75%, but then the following year it's dropping to 25%, it's, it's over the entire life. So we just wanted to make that um, that one point, and that's also including any indirect rate that you're applying to the subcontract cost. Right, so the, right now the rule is based on cost. We'll yep. talk about what the proposed rule is, which is a different a different calculation. 
one of the things that we always um, remind a lot of uh, a lot of our clients when they're putting proposals together. So right now, the uh, the rule is that if you were a small business prime, um, and I'm talking about service the service contracts, um, we'll get to uh, construction in just a minute, but um, that you need to provide more than 50% based on cost. So it's 50% of your fully burdened cost um, compared to your subcontractor's cost plus any indirects you apply. It can get kind of complicated from a monitoring standpoint um, currently, particularly on a fixed price contract. On a cost type contract, that's an easy calculation and it's easy to monitor, but it certainly can be a lot more difficult um, on a on a fixed price contract. So jumping into more of the service contracts, um, and these are when they're award, uh, awarded to service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses. At least 50% of the cost of personnel must be performed by the employees of the concern. Um, and then it, it's a very similar rule for supply contracts. Now, this is different if it's a construction contract. The 50% rule actually drops to 15%. And if you think from a, a high level, usually the prime contract awardee is more of a general contractor, and then they sub out most of the work. Um, and this is just for construction comments or construction contracts, um, but for that it drops down to 15%. So there are some differences when it comes to limitations of subcontracting for hub zones, and this is in regards to special trade construction contracts. So in this instance, you have to have at least 25% of the cost for the personnel performed by the prime hub zone. But you can also subcontract out a total of 50% to other hub zones. Uh, it, in that situation. So before we switch gears to what the proposed rules are, so so as you can see under the current rules, um, the subcontract limitations are measured based on the cost um, the cost of the contract, not the not the overall contract price or value, um, and Essentially, it doesn't matter, uh, except in these, except in a few limited situations. It doesn't matter if your subcontract, who you're subcontracting to, the the prime small business has to perform, you know, generally 50% of the work on their own service contract. So, um, the these proposed rules, which we think will be a lot easier for companies to um, administer and monitor, um, do propose some pretty significant changes that we think are probably favorable to small businesses and um, and I think um, probably enhance um, opportunities for small businesses to subcontract to other small businesses. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to John Ford to talk about um, uh, what these new proposed uh, rules are and, and some background on that. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the genesis for these changes uh, is found in the fiscal year 2013 National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, there, Congress amended the Small Business Act to address uh, revised limitations on subcontracting. What Congress provided was that uh, the revised limitation on subcontracting would require prime contractors to incur no less than 50% of, or to, uh, yes, incur no less than 50% of the um, contract payments that they received from the government that would go to the prime contractor. Now, in computing that 50% of the contract payments, if the prime awarded a subcontract to a similarly situated small business concern, that subcontracted amount to the similarly situated concern did not count as subcontracted amount, but in essence was considered work done by the prime. So if you have a hub zone set aside, the hub zone concern could issue subcontracts to hub zone subcontractors. Those would be similarly situated. Similarly, if you had an 8A prime contractor, the 8A prime contractor could award subcontracts to 8A concerns and not have those uh, 
con subcontracts awarded to 8A concerns counted toward the 50% limitation. You'll notice that what I said, the revised uh, uh, NDAA limitation of subcontracting is based on what the contractor is paid under the contract, not the costs that are incurred in performing the contract. So as Susan indicated earlier, this will make it much easier uh, to determine compliance, particularly in regard to uh, fixed price contracts and TNM contracts, where determining what the labor costs were, you know what the hourly rate was on a TNM contract, but you didn't know what the actual cost was, or you had a very difficult time computing that. So since it's based on contract payments and subcontract payments, it's much easier to determine the new rules. Now, as I mentioned, the Congress amended the Small Business Act in 2013. Then the SBA issued its revised rules in May of 2016, implementing the revised statutory limitations of subcontracting. Now, the primary changes to the SBA rules uh, in regard to limitation of subcontracting is found in 13 CFR 125.6. The NDA did not address limitations on subcontracting for construction contracts. Instead, it left it up to the SBA to issue rules that would say what or how the revised limitations would apply to construction contracts. So when the SBA issued its rules in 2016, the SBA uh, did provide guidance in regard to construction contracts. And as you uh, see here on this slide, what you're looking at here is that for general construction, uh, contract set aside for any class of small business, the contractor will not pay more than 85% of the amount paid by the government to firms that are not similarly situated. So again, this is based on contract amount. So uh, what will happen here is that the prime cannot subcontract out more than 85% of the contract value. Now, again, for uh, construction contracts, the uh, if a reward is made to a similarly situated subcontractor, that does not count as a subcontract award. Uh, however, if a second tier subcontract is awarded, that does count. So it's only the work that will be performed by the prime contract and first tier subs uh, that are fall within this revised limitation of subcontracting. And John, yes. when, you make the, when you make the reference similarly situated subcontractor, does that really mean so if it's an 8A contract award, a similarly situated would be another 8A subcontractor or any small business? Uh, it would be 8A subcontractors. However, if the award is a small business award, any concern that is a small business qualifies as a similarly situated concern. Okay, makes sense. Okay. Now then let me just make one thing clear here. The size of the subcontractor, because it has to be another similarly situated small business, the size of the subcontractor will be determined by the NAICS code assigned by the prime to the subcontractor. It may be that NAICS code may be different from the NAICS code that is assigned to the prime contract. So that's a, a pitfall that you have to look out for. So if the subcontractor is not small under the NAICS code assigned to the sub, but is small under the NAICS code assigned to the prime, that is not a similarly situated subcontractor. The SBA also revised the rules in regard to. Uh, special trade contractors, and again, under the construction rules, uh, the cost of materials 
is eliminated from uh, determining what has been paid to subcontractors. So here we have a definition of what is the cost of materials for construction, and we have also as a separate rule uh, for supply contracts because the cost of materials is also exempted from determining how much has been paid to subcontractors under a supply contract. The cost of materials is excluded from the subcontract value for both supply contracts and construction contracts. And here we have we're getting into uh, now the SBA rules for supply and service contracts. We've discussed this a little bit earlier, but again, this reiterates what we have said before about what constitutes a similarly situated subcontractor. So, uh, uh, just to jump in, John, I think that the the, the NAICS code is the, the real key to, to point out that it's really based on that prime contract NAICS code that is then used to help determine uh, the small business size. Right. Yeah, for the prime contractor. However, the prime determines what NAICS code may be applicable to a subcontractor. Uh, for example, you may have a service contract that requires the use of uh, supplies, and the prime contractor issues a contract for supplies to a subcontractor. So a different NAICS code would apply to the subcontractor and applies to the prime contractor, or could apply. So you have to be careful about the NAICS code and what is considered a similarly situated subcontractor. There has to be a small business with, within under the NAICS code assigned to the subcontract, and it has to be of the same category as the prime contract. And as I said, a small, a small business set aside, any small business would qualify as a similarly situated subcontractor. Okay, I want to point out that you may have sub, what I'll call a hybrid contract, which has uh, service plans and supply plans in it. It's up to the contracting officer to decide what appropriate NAICS code goes into that, sub, into that prime contract. It will either be a service NAICS code or a supply NAICS code. You cannot have two NAICS codes applicable to the same contract. Good point. To make sure you understand that, yeah. No, so the limitation on subcontracting will be determined by the NAICS code assigned by the contracting officer. And they say you have service plans and supply plans, but there is a service uh, NAICS code assigned to the contract, the limitation on subcontracting will be applied to, say, the service portion of that contract, not the entire contract. So this is a change that you have to be aware of. So it may not be the entire value of the contract that you're considering in looking at compliance with limitation of subcontractings, but if a service code is applied to a contract that calls for both supplies and services, it's only the services component that you look at to determine compliance with the limitation of subcontracting. The SBA also came up with some new rules about the period of time that will be used for determining compliance with the, with the uh, limitations. For a total or partial set-aside uh, contract, it will be the base term and then each subsequent option period. For orders, it's the order period, not the total contract. So you have an IDIQ contract, it's the order period of the order that you're looking at, and or the period of performance for each order. When you're looking at an order set aside under a full and open contract or a full and open contract with reserve. Now, if the contract is a set aside IDIQ, you look at the uh, overall contract. However, the contracting officer under the SBA rules has the discretion to require compliance with the 50% rule at each order. So assuming this is approved as proposed, that's an important point. So this is in the SBA rules. So the SBA rules provide contracting officers with that discretion. Okay. Uh, 
jumping ahead just a little bit, we'll see that the proposed rule that goes into the FAR does not address this issue, which may be a good thing. Now, uh, this is one thing that uh, comes up. Uh, work by an independent contractor will be considered a subcontractor. Now, the term independent contractor is not defined in the SBA rules, but uh, this may be considered uh, what is commonly referred to as 1099 employees. So this is an open issue as to what is meant by an independent contractor. But if you use an independent contractor, uh, whatever that means, under the SBA rules, that independent contractor uh, should be of the same class as the prime contractor to avoid any limitations on subcontracting problems. So, John, this is an important, uh, this change is potentially helpful to small businesses. So I know we get the question asked a lot. We have a small business uh, contractor that has a contract and they have a few people that they want to use as independent contractors, again, assuming they meet the requirements for an independent um, contractor 1099 um, uh, individual and so they always we always get asked the question well does this count towards my um, labor and so our advice now under the current rule is no that does not count as your the prime contractor's labor is considered a subcontractor so it would still be considered a subcontractor but to the extent that it's obviously an independent contractor is probably a small business um, so that um, that would probably not be as much of an issue as it is now for a lot of companies. As long as they're of the same uh, class as the prime contractor, which may be an issue with uh, you know 8A hub you know 8A hub zone and service disabled uh, veteran or small businesses, the uh, the independent contractor may be a small business, but not a hub zone or service disabled. Oh, okay, so in, right. So that may not really help. Right. So in that okay. case, they would not be similarly situated. So that uh, subcontract to the independent contractor would be considered an award to a non-similarly situated subcontractor and count toward that 50% of contract uh, payments. Okay, so this probably doesn't make, really change it that much. Yeah. Now then, here we get to uh, the FAR councils. What we had mentioned is that the SBA changed its rules in 2016, and then on December the 4th, 2018, the FAR councils uh, published a proposed rule for comment in the Federal Register with comments due by February the 4th. So the, the comment period time has closed now, but that means the ball would be in the FAR Council's court to start working on an analysis of any public comments received and working toward issuance of the final regulations. What the the council are proposing in the uh, new rule is to eliminate the limitation of subcontracting requirements from the clauses that are listed above. You know that we talked about for the separate clauses for hub zone services, able veteran owned, economically disadvantaged women owned small businesses and women owned small businesses, and to consolidate all limitation of subcontracting requirements in one clause that is 52 to 19.14, which is the clause that people generally think of. Now then, uh, the new clause would be generally applicable to contracts except contracts for COTS items and small business set-aside uh, set contracts that do not exceed the small purchase uh, threshold. And the uh, draft of uh, the new 219.14 essentially mirrors the SBA rule. So it should be very little controversy about revised draft rules for the FAR since it is essentially the same as what is in the SBA rules. 
and doesn't require any uh, new rulemaking that has not already been done through the SBA or the concepts. Some uh, things that are in the revised clause uh, deals with uh, joint ventures. And it says that uh, a joint venture qualifies as a small business under the NAICS code assigned to the contract. The joint venture has to agree that the joint venture itself will perform uh, the applicable percentage specified in the contract. That is, the, the joint venture participants will meet that requirement. And uh, as I mentioned, the proposed FAR rule does not discuss the period used to determine compliance. And the proposed rule does not discuss allowing the contracting officer to allow the limitation of subcontracting to apply to each order under a task or delivery order contract. So it looks like the FAR is contemplating uh, overall uh, contract compliance. Now then, to speed things up a little bit for DOD, on December the 3rd, 2018, DOD issued a class deviation to the various small business uh, clauses that we discussed earlier. And what the DOD did was to bring forward the SBA's rules into each of the separate clauses that we discussed earlier. DOD in the deviation is keeping each of the clauses that are currently in the FAR, but are changing the paragraphs in those clauses that deal with limitation of subcontracting and replacing them with what is in the SBA rules. The deviation doesn't change the applicability of any of the current FAR clauses, so they will still go into the current contracts as specified in the FAR. Now, one important thing to notice about the deviation is that is it, that it was effective upon issuance. So you don't have to worry about going forward or a later date for it to become effective, but the deviation was effective on December 3rd, 2018. And so John, that would mean uh, that for any RFP issued after December 3rd, 2018, DOD RFP. That's correct. Now then, one of the things, the deviation states that it applies to the issuance of orders under task and delivery order contracts and is effective immediately. That raises the question as to whether it applies to existing IDIQ or requirements contracts so that the limitation of subcontracting would apply to any orders issued under existing uh, contracts uh, after December the 3rd, 2018. A reading uh, of the deviation would seem to indicate that since it is uh, effective upon issuance, that it would and does apply to the issue of orders, uh, that it would apply to existing contracts. However, the deviation did not provide any guidance as to whether existing contracts should be amended to include the revised clauses that are covered by the deviation in existing contracts. So John, under that, so under that scenario, so if a contractor, small business contract, DOD contract that a IDIQ has been in place, um, and so, as you indicated, it, it, it appears that it would apply to subsequent orders. Should contractors seek clarification from their contracting officer in this case, or any recommendations in that regard? Well, I think each contractor should do an analysis of their particular business situation. Because with any rule change, there are going to be winners and losers. There are going to be some small businesses that will not be benefited by the revised changes being proposed to the FAR rules or the DOD deviation. Uh, I'll, however, I suspect that most small business contractors will benefit from those new rules. 
So if you would benefit from the application of the new rules, I would suggest addressing this issue with your contracting officer. There is nothing wrong with amending a contract to include updated clauses. In fact, the FAR has a mechanism for, for doing that. It's in uh, FAR 1.108. So if contractors um, look at that and then go to the contracting officer and bring up the issue, if it would be beneficial to the particular small business prime contract or to have the new rules applied in their situation, I would definitely bring it up with the contracting officer and to see about getting an amendment to my current contracts to include the revised clauses, those clauses that were revised by the deviation. So then in summary, uh, for DOD contracts, um, the effective date for the implementation of this is December 3rd or after December 3rd, 2018. For all other agencies, we need to await the FAR Council um, approval and implementation of the rule. Is that correct? Correct. And I know we never know, the, again, the, the comment period just ended. Um, any indication of what you think the likely effective date, you know, how long this is going to take? I know you don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> no. However, as I said, the SBA has already uh, implemented these rules. And the uh, FAR Council basically is just adopting what the SBA has already uh, promulgated through the rulemaking comment uh, process. So, uh, interested parties had the opportunity to submit comments to the SBA when the SBA was revising its rules and the SBA has already considered comments in promulgating what's in the current version of the SBA rules. So I do not anticipate any great controversy coming in from uh, the comments challenging parts of the re proposed revised rules, and I would expect that the FAR councils could fast track uh, this process, and it would be uh, merely a matter of a few months before uh, we have the final rule that's issued. Yeah, okay. I'm surprised of one thing about what the FAR councils did, that they did not publish an interim rule with comments. Right. So this is uh, something that we will obviously be following um, and will certainly post on our blog when uh, when the FAR Council does issue the final rule. So um, I guess final sort of takeaway is we think that this is overall a good change. We think it's for the most part particularly helpful to small businesses and their ability to subcontract to to encourage the subcontracting to other small businesses. And the determination is now, instead of being based on cost, which again was sometimes difficult to, uh, to calculate, will be based on the overall price. So again, I think it's you know encouraging for subcontracting to other small businesses and um, the monitoring should be should be easier. So um, I think generally we feel like this is a, a pretty favorable new rule, and um, hopefully you found this information um, informative um, as you work with your contracts and, uh, and try to implement and see how this affects your organization. That is all that we have for today. Uh, once again, we thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope you found this helpful. Um, we try to put out a number of webinars on things that are of interest to, to our clients uh, and friends. Uh, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the slides, so they will be available. And again, if you do have any specific questions, we're happy to um, answer them. And if it's something that we think would be helpful to the, to the larger group, we will um, follow that up in the email or post something on our blog. Um, thank you very much for attending.